So we provide efficiency solutions for people fixing commercial trucks and off-highway equipment. It's logistics and freight and supply chain is a very important piece of our economy. And we're the people behind the scenes that are enabling repair facilities to keep all their equipment on the road. This is Dennis Consorte with Snackable Solutions, and I am here with Tyler Robertson. How are you, Tyler? I am doing great, and thank you for inviting me on the show. Glad to have you. And you're down in South Carolina. What's it like over there? You know, it's not too bad right now, weather-wise and everything, but it's winter. It'll be nice and warm, and we complain how hot it is before we know it. <laughs> it's funny. A lot of people from New York, where I'm from, they go down to Florida but then they end up coming back to the Carolinas and living there. And somebody told me that they're called halfbacks. Is that true? You know, that is the terminology we use. And I grew up in Minnesota, so I'm going to halfback because I just end up staying down here forever. But it's, it's a great area. I had the chance a couple years ago when I quit my job to do my business. I could be anywhere. And we love it here in South Carolina. It's a great place, one of the fastest growing states. And uh, a lot of opportunity down here. That's awesome. And your company is Diesel Laptops. And when I first heard the name, I just thought it meant they were cool laptops, they ran fast, but this is something else. Tell me about that. So we provide efficiency solutions for people fixing commercial trucks and off-highway equipment. So if anything COVID's taught us in the last two years, it's logistics and freight and supply chain is a very important piece of our economy. And we're the people behind the scenes that are enabling repair facilities to keep all their equipment on the road. And when it does break down, let's get it back on the road as quick as we possibly can. I was just at the movie theater with my kids a week ago, and they're all out of popcorn. They're all out of soda. They're out of candy. They're out of everything. And what did they blame? They blame the trucks. So we're the people that are trying to help alleviate problems like that. Yeah, that makes good sense. And I think you're right. We're in the middle of this great resignation. And... From what I understand, there's even a shortage of truckers, which means there's so much more of a reason to make sure that the equipment works. Is there anything you want to touch on regarding that? It, it's not just the drivers, it's on the repair side too. So right now on Indeed.com, there's around 60 to 80,000 open diesel, check, diesel technician jobs. Our technical schools will produce less than 10,000 this year. And that, and that number has been changing and getting worse and worse year after year. So it's really a problem that gets fixed two ways. It gets fixed with software and technical solutions like we do, and it gets fixed by getting more people involved in being diesel techs. So we're trying to do both sides of that equation. And it's a problem that's still gonna get a lot worse before it gets better. And it ends up being not a good situation for, for everybody really that eats, buys, or uses anything. So truck probably brought it. That's amazing. And what it does sound like is there's an opportunity in the diesel tech space, either for people looking for a career change or for businesses. Is that what you find? And how do you interface with them? It, it is. One of the things we've done is we've partnered up with a, a company called American Diesel Training Centers. So they take people that are really in low skill, low paying jobs. So retail workers, restaurant workers, that type of thing and hospitality. And they say, hey, why don't you go through this 12 week program? And when you come out, we'll make sure you make a lot more money than when you started. And by the way, you need to pay nothing for this upfront. We'll just deal with it afterwards. And I'll tell you what, it works. They, they come to this program after 12 weeks. I don't remember the exact numbers, but something staggering, like 12 bucks an hour more per hour they're making. And they have a career path after they go through this program. And people are hiring them as fast as they can possibly find them. So it's a great profession to get into. Diesel technicians, top tier, they can make $100,000 a year easy in, in this industry and work wherever they want, never have to worry about a job the rest of their lives. And in terms of wherever they want, this isn't just about trucks. I saw pictures of Lambos on your social media profiles. Where could somebody apply these skills? Everything got complicated with emissions, with electronic vehicles coming, with e autonomous robots driving vehicles coming. It It is an industry, John Deere even announced last week, they have robot tractors now tilling fields and, and farming. So it's a skill set. Once you learn, you can go into automotive, go into marine, go into power sports, go into industrial, go into uh, off highway and agriculture, on highway commercial diesel. There's skill sets that are just transferable from one industry to another. You'll never worry about finding a job in your life if you get into this industry. I do have to ask the hard question though. And that is that we do see a push for electric vehicles that's that's growing, whether it will actually produce the outcomes that they want or, or not. What, what do you say to that? That's the obvious question. So the, the line we give people today 
is there's more Bugattis on the road than class eight commercial trucks. And the class eight commercial trucks or the EVs are the big ones with the sleepers that people are used to seeing. So it's gonna be a hot minute before electric vehicles takes over commercial truck world. But even with that said, there's opportunity for us because now they don't have engines, but you know what they do have? Complex electronics and, and batteries and other things that are going on with them. So for us, it is something that, yeah, we have an year or two, but there's also an opportunity for us. And we're gonna be there at the forefront of it. We were actually late as a company. We're a seven-year-old company getting involved in diesel diagnostics. So we were late. People have been around for 20, 30 years, our competitors. For us, it's the great equalizer because now we're all starting over again. So we get kind of a second crack at it in our industry and in our space. So we're actually really excited about the opportunities. That's great. So tell me about these diesel laptops. What do they do exactly? How does one use it to diagnose problems? So it got really complicated really quick. So in our industry, when new trucks come out, the people that sell the trucks, the dealers, they get all kinds of training and support from the factory and all these things. Then you have the people that buy hundreds or thousands of trucks. They also get a lot of love and attention from the dealers and the manufacturers. But truthfully, that's just a small part of the market that actually owns trucks and fixes trucks. The rest of the market was given nothing. And they just said, go figure it out. So what happens there is there's a lot of chaos and people don't know and they don't have access to information and knowledge and repair information and diagnostic tools. So we stepped in and we said, hey, we're not only gonna provide you with a great tool in your shop, but we're gonna actually build all the repair information that tells you what to fix once that tool tells you the problem. Nobody really did that. We're gonna staff a call center with diesel techs and IT pros. So we're gonna help you remotely fix your vehicles as you go as well. And we're gonna put up training centers throughout the United States. So we have training locations all over the US and we teach people not only how to use software, but mainly how to properly diagnose and fix something. That's the bigger problem we're trying to solve. And then through all of that, at the end of the day, if you ever worked on anything that's ever broken, a lawnmower, a golf cart, a car that you own, you know you need to buy something to fix it usually. And what part do I need to buy? Where, who has it? What's the price? When can I get it? And that's another piece we're building is a big marketplace to connect all those things to allow transparency for people to instantly see price and availability and know their options when they buy something. So it's kind of putting all those pieces together and being a true solution to a company not just a product that you sell inside a company. And I think that's been one of our huge differentiators with all our competitors is being able to put all that together and really solve problems for our customers. Yeah, and I think this is important for our broader audience of small business owners and startups, which is you really do need the right tools and the right systems for your business to operate effectively. What would you, what would you say to somebody who's maybe outside of your industry in terms of how they might apply some of this knowledge to how they build their company. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because you said it exactly right. As we were going through here, you start to learn that you have to approach things differently and you have to go to market differently and you have to change the way your company operates differently. So I started this in my garage and dining room table with just me. We have around 200 employees now and do north of 50 million in revenue. And we were stuck for a long time at a certain threshold and we, we couldn't get above it. And what it came down to is we didn't have the right leadership. They didn't have the right skill sets. They didn't have the right knowledge and tools. And we were just lacking in things we didn't know. And that's one of the biggest barriers that companies face is they just don't know things and they get stuck working in the business, not on the business. And through that whole process, we were able to really turn the corner. So if you ever saw a chart of our company revenue, we kind of skyrocketed plateaued and then skyrocketed again. And that plateau was when we just got stuck and we, we had to change how we did things and how we operated as a company. And that's really tough to do, but you, you have to do it if you want to keep growing your business and you have to keep focusing on not putting out fires and not dealing with the day-to-day -day and focus on how am I going to grow my company 20% next year. And I think a lot of small businesses don't get in that mentality. They just get stuck doing the things they do every single day. And if you don't put a plan together, we always say around here, a goal without a plan is just a wish. So let's make this an actual plan and let's put this together and let's go have this happen. So it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and it's probably one of the more difficult things we've had to do internally as a company. There is a lot of truth to that. And I'd love to hear your founder's story from when you started out as an entrepreneur, maybe some of the struggles you went through where you realized I need to change the way that I lead my company and grow my company and, and all of those things. I'd love to hear about some of that. Yeah. So I didn't intend any of this. I just intended to quit my job and just kind of make a living. My wife didn't work. I had a one-year-old and a three-year-old. I just wanted to provide for them and I would spend time with them. They're grown up. They're young. Enjoy those years. Everyone tells you this and that they're gone in a blink. 
But as you went through, you started to realize there's just not enough hours in the day. And I was just working more and more hours and not spending time with my family, which is the whole point of why I did this to begin with. So it just it meant hiring more people as we went. I made so many mistakes there along the way, but there's so many great stories as well. So like a great story is my director of operations, our second in command I have here today, he ended up graduating high school, doing you know his own learning, his own testing, not even going through traditional school. And he was making pizzas and subs. And that's when I found him. And now he's our second in command. And the, the kid's absolutely brilliant over here. And he does a great job for us. So we got stories like that. And then we got the horror stories of just hiring the wrong people. I, I had an Amazon hacker steal $40,000 from us. I had an employee forging signatures and, and stealing money out of our pockets. It's all those things that you just learn and have to grow through as a company. And some are unavoidable, some are avoidable. But we made conscious decisions in the very beginning to say, let's care about sales and marketing and let's just keep selling stuff and we'll figure out the rest later. And the rest later caught up with us every once in a while, but it's okay. You just got to learn and take it as an expensive learning lesson and keep growing and building your company. So let's talk about the, the hiring side of things. It, it sounds like you had a couple of hurdles to overcome, but you figured out a way to move past them and maybe to change your hiring process so that you'd have fewer of those things happen in the future. What advice would you give small business owners when they look to hire people? What should they be watching out for? I'm really bad at hiring people. I literally would hire the first warm body that would show up at the interview and be like, you're hired. Let's go to work. I'm just impatient. So I was like, man, what am I going to learn in a 30 minute interview to distinguish this one from another? He's got the credentials or she, let's just hire him. And that worked for a while, but then we ended up with some bad culture and some things that shouldn't have been going on here at the company. Um, and we brought in, I, I was very fortunate. We, we found a, a senior VP of HR. He worked at Amazon previously and Kia Motors, and he, he had been around some bigger companies and he was willing to take a risk with a smaller company. It cost us a lot of money at the time. I was like, man, how am I going to pay him? I was literally paying him more than I was taking out of the company at that point. But we knew if we didn't fix it, we were never going to fix the culture. We'd never get the right people in here. And it was becoming a zoo and a madhouse. And we just had to draw a line in the sand. And I'm glad I did in hindsight. He's done a tremendous job turning things around. I went from thinking I don't need an HR department to I got three people in the department and probably need a fourth. So it's one of those important pieces behind the scenes that every company needs at, at any point. You've got to get the right people into the company. And it's a tough thing to do sometimes. I think it's important to hire experts for those important roles. And I think the other piece of it is sometimes small business owners struggle between do I hire an employee? Do I hire a contractor? Do I partner with a vendor? What do you have to say to them in that sort of decision-making process? We, we've been through the same thing. So a lot of our salespeople, when we hired them, they were 1099s. That's what my first person wanted to, and that's how we kept going. But then you realize you lose control when you do that stuff as well. You can't really tell them what to do or how to do things. They're contractors. They're not employees. So you work through that. And then we also have outside companies as well. So our software engineering department is a great example. I have a combination of employees. I got a combination of 1099s. And we also have third-party outsourcing companies we need to use as well. So for us, it's all looking at everything and finding out the right mixture. In, in terms of software, we just said, we want to go faster. And we knew we couldn't scale up our own infrastructure and our own management and leadership team fast enough to go. So we had to go outside and bring in some outside companies for certain projects. And that's worked out great for us. It's expensive, but it's worked out really well in terms of getting projects going. So I think every company needs to look at it in their perspective and really figure out what's best for them. And don't be afraid to try. It's okay to go try and something. If it doesn't work, that's great. You learn something, but at least go try before just assuming it's not going to go work out or it will work out. Yeah, I agree with you. Every mistake brings us a little closer to the truth, to the answers we want. And with your internal team, it sounds like maybe your leadership style changed over the years. What does leadership look like at your company today? Any advice you'd give to other business owners? I had to get out of my own way. That's what I always tell people because I realized I was the one trying to micromanage and control things. And, and finally I was talking to someone. He's like, Tyler, you just got to trust they're They're going to get it done. Just not the way you want it done. And that's okay. They probably will find a better way to do it. In fact, and that's really tough, I think, for a lot of small business owners. I, I can't tell you how many small business owners I talk to. They're just involved in every little minutiae of their business. And then they wonder why they have no free time to go grow their business because they're tied up in these other things. And that was the trade-off I quickly learned was like, man, if I don't have to do that anymore, I just freed up eight hours of my week to go work on this other thing, which is way more important to the company versus what I was doing. 
And it's really hard to give up control, especially when they fail. Like I just told you earlier, I've had people steal money from me. It's because I gave up control over something that I should have maybe not ever done in a different way. And that's okay. We, we learned our lessons through that. But you have to give up control and you have to go trust the people you hire are going to go execute and you got to reward them properly. If they're bringing you home a lot, you need to pay them as much. So we're not opposed to paying out bonuses and paying a lot of money around here. If people are executing. That's great. That's what we hired you for. Please keep doing it. And when you talk about freeing up time, I feel like that's what people really need when they want to get to that next level. And what you described was you had a growth spurt and then you hit a plateau and then you had another growth spurt and you hit another plateau. Tell me how you got past each of those plateaus to the point where you're a $50 million company now. A lot of it was just realizing we had to step back and be like, why is this happening? What are we not executing on? What are we not doing? And once you start to kind of peel the onion back a little bit, you dig deeper and deeper and you find things, you start to find those little pieces of the company and that aren't executing. So the sub first couple were easy. It was, hey, marketing, you're doing a great job. You're delivering us thousands of leads a month. And then you go talk to sales, like we're busy closing deals, but then you peel the onion back and you go, oh wait, why are 80% of my sales calls going to voicemail? Because we didn't have enough staff. We didn't have it organized the right way. I and mean, we weren't doing these other things. And it's been that time and time and time again inside the company when we look back. And then the other part is strategic planning, being really intentional on where do we want to be in three years and five years? Okay, if that's where we're going to be, how are we going to get there? What pieces do we need to fill in order to make that happen? And how are we going to afford it and do those things? And that's strategic planning. We're just on year, really year two and a half of strategic planning. But I can tell you, everyone in the company knows now where we need to get to. Two years ago, they had no idea. It was just come to work, show up, do your job. This year, they know exactly what we're trying to get to. They all know what their bonus is if we get there and beyond where we're going to get to. So now the employees aren't asking, what do I do today? They're like, how do we get to that big number? We said we get the big bonuses at. What do we have to do to get there? So it gets everyone rolling the boat in the same direction. It gets everyone clear on where we're trying to go. And you have to have that clarity inside your organization. Otherwise, you're never going to grow where you wanted to get it, get it to. I want to pivot a little bit and talk about space. I saw a picture of your building. It's, it's huge. You've got almost 200 employees and you've got this huge space for your company. So first, is that a space you own? Is it leased? And how do you know when it's the right time to acquire space, especially in today's environment? Good question. So here's our evolution. It was me and my dining room table, then the garage. Then my, because I had a home office going, right? So now a third of the house is taken. And then we rented a little small, like back of a photography studio area. And then we got bigger areas. But as I was started to go, I knew I needed to get out of the house and into these properties. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to buy it because I have no idea if I'm going to even survive as a company, number one. If I do survive, how much of a property do I need? We didn't know. So we just kept asking landlords, like, can we do a 12 month lease? That was our first couple. And then eventually it was like, okay, let's go buy a place. I remember walking through it. I was like, man, this place is bigger than I can possibly imagine. It's five times the size of my rental. This will last us for five years. And at month seven, we were like, we're out of space. What are we going to do? And I just, you know, went and spent $600,000 buying something. So then we found the next bigger place. And we were fortunate to not put very much money into the places we were buying. We did the bare minimal. So we were able to buy and sell pretty quickly. And, and every time we had a commercial property and found a new place to buy, we sold the old place within three or four months. We felt that was a better strategy than signing long-term leases and long-term agreements at that point. Even the building we're at now, it's about 40,000 square feet, um, but truthfully we run out of space. So I just signed a contract to buy a second building in town down the road where we'll move part of our company over there and about the 14 acres around it. But with building costs and everything else, all of a sudden the 14 acres, we were like, oh, well, then they're building on the property. And it ended up being about $5 million to do that. And we're like, nope, let's just go buy another place. What's the bare minimum we have to do to get by, to keep going? We don't know where our business is going to grow, how fast. We got to keep, keep, let's not paint ourselves in a corner here. Let's stay flexible. And because we bootstrap this thing, we're really cognizant of how much cash we have in the bank. We really want to make sure we have enough funding there to be able to keep going through our growth plans and not get, not get tied up too much. And what about today? I feel like every company has unique needs and in some ways been forced to move to a more remote environment. Uh, some of us like it. I, I like working remote. I've been a remote worker for many years. How does your business operate? Are you able to work in sort of a hybrid model or do people have to be on site? It, it, it's, it's hybrid. I mean, COVID, there's always some silver linings. And one of them was learning. We have certain departments that operate better at home. <laughs> they don't need to be here. 
Marketing department's a great example of that. Our sales department, our sales staff, the team deals with all the incoming inquiries and phone calls. There are a lot of 20 year olds. It's their first professional job. They don't know anything about a truck or diagnostics. They don't know anyone in the company. We have to put them through a boot camp where we teach them all these things. And we learned that the majority of the 20 year olds we're bringing in weren't, weren't ready to go work at home by themselves. So I, I think it's been part of that learning experience here at the company. And the other problem with remote, it gets really difficult with culture and getting people involved and feeling like a part of the company. But definitely the departments that have the stronger management leadership team and the departments that have the more experienced employees, they do great at home, much more difficult for the inexperienced managers and the inexperienced employees. So that's usually where the line's drawn. They were still kind of a hybrid-ish schedule and everyone's working through it the best they can, especially with Omicron going the way it is. Now, you mentioned training and you have a podcast. If I wanted to get into the truck repair business, what does the training look like and what questions should I ask myself to decide, is this for me? So in our industry, you know, kind of like I mentioned earlier, all these customers that get all these new trucks and the dealers, they get all this great training and the rest of the world's left to figure it out. And no one's ever offered aftermarket training classes to people, which blows my mind because these are the people that are fixing the majority of the commercial trucks and engines that are out there. So we went to market and we said, really, we're trying to help people be more efficient. Part of that's the tool. Part of that's the information. Part of that's the training. So we started launching these classes and I didn't know if anyone would show up. I didn't know. We said, hey, well, people show up to learn a full day about electrical and commercial trucks or a whole day about emission systems or a whole day about hydraulic systems. So we didn't know. And I think we've figured out and answered, yes, people will come to those classes. They want online. They want in person. They want a little bit of both. And that's fine. We're going to provide all that stuff. And it's great because it gave us a huge market differentiator. Now you buy a tool from me, you also get a voucher to one of my classes. And you can come to my classes and learn how to use the tool and how to diagnose properly and do those things. So it created a huge differentiator for us and it created a new revenue stream. So we just signed on, we just put a location up in Chicago, we announced that a couple months ago. We just signed a lease for one in Atlanta and we're looking up in the Northeast as well. So for us, it's a great value add tool and it's its own revenue stream and it's filling a market need. So I think when people are always like looking for business ideas, you just gotta start asking questions and looking at your own business and talking to your own customers. You'll find there's plenty of opportunity out there. You just gotta decide which one you wanna walk through. And when it comes to customer acquisition, where do most of your clients come from? Or how do you find them? We do, a, so we're in the B2B business and we're in the truck, truck repair business, which is as old school as it can get. I mean, people, dealers still have geographical regions. People don't sell parts online. There's this whole thing going on. And I came to the market and said, you know what? I can't grow my business with door-to-door -door salespeople. I tried it. It was horrible. We couldn't scale it. And we said, we got to do this a better way. So literally we looked at doing online marketing, both paid and organic. And that is still where we live and breathe today. Our marketing department delivers north of a thousand new potential customers every single month through our sales department. And I know when I first started doing it years ago, everyone's like, man, you can't use Facebook to go grow your diesel diagnostic business. And I can say, Unequivocal game, yes, you'd be amazed at what you can target online. People are in all kinds of niches and specialities. You just gotta find where they are, put the right message in front of them and have the right conversations and, and you can definitely go grow it. The podcast, another one you mentioned, I launched a podcast myself two years ago, done about a hundred episodes now. That's been a tremendous marketing tool for our company. It's been a great thing for strategic relationships. You gotta keep finding new ways to do things inside our company. And we still do that today. We hired a full-time social media manager now. It's her job just to talk to people online and grow channels and, and do those things. And that's the only way we've found to really effectively scale our business quickly and efficiently like we want to here at Diesel Laptops. And you made a snackable solution for us. I don't want you to go through the whole thing again here because you made a wonderful video that we'll share with people. But why don't you give us a little teaser on what they can expect to get out of that if they watch it. So there is a way I delivered last year over 2 million views of my content online and it cost me $0. It's the best business to business networking tool ever built and it's absolutely free to use, which is LinkedIn. So I started posting on LinkedIn a couple of years ago and it was just my outlet at first to share about my journey and my experience. And I didn't have mentors or investors or these things. I just wanted a place to talk and meet with other people going through the same thing. And LinkedIn is that place to do it. And the strategic relationships I've got with other companies now, the business we've gotten out of there, the relationships we've gotten with our customers, it is unmeasurable in my mind. And 
I really hope people understand it's not a place just to go find jobs or go put spammy posts up about selling products. There's actually a great way to use that platform. There's multiple ways to use it. And I found one that works tremendous for us. And I, I really hope people take the time to, to learn a little bit more about it. And it sounds like what you're saying is that even though your industry is pretty old school, people are not into technology as much as other industries, you're still finding them on platforms like LinkedIn. You, you absolutely are. It's like my, my dad, he's big into flying and he's up in town this weekend. And there's a local place, little town, little airstrip, and they do flight lessons and demos and pilot experiences. And the guy was complaining to my dad a little business they have. And I just wanted to go grab that guy and be like, go online, just go to LinkedIn or Facebook or something. <laughs> put ads out there. I guarantee you, you put an ad out there for $200 for a, for a pilot experience. You'll get people signed up left and right for you. But they just don't know these things. And it's hard for small businesses to get into it because there is a lot of scammy stuff and spammy stuff and a lot of traps and things you have to work through. But I'm telling you what, I built a business that does over 50 million a year doing online marketing. And I know I can get to 100 million doing it. You can too, whoever's listening to this in your business, you just got to find the right way to do it. I agree with you. And Tyler, we're almost out of time here. So why don't you tell us how people can find you online? Well, as I mentioned LinkedIn earlier, that is the best place to connect with me. I love meeting entrepreneurs, business owners, everything on there. So LinkedIn, if you just search for Tyler Robertson or Tyler Robertson Diesel, will we'll pop right up there. If you happen to be looking at this and you have anything to do with truck or transportation uh, or truck repair, go to diesellaptops.com. There's a ton of stuff you can learn on there. Our products are on there, the learning center and videos and all, all kinds of stuff. It's again, online marketing. It's a place we like to hang out. Diesellaptops.com has a ton of that. Awesome. And Tyler, if there were one other piece of advice or inspiration you'd like to share with our audience of small business owners and entrepreneurs, is there anything you'd like to say? I started my company with literally less than $1,000 and no business plan and, and not knowing what to do. You can definitely do it. There are a million ways to make money in this market. You just got to be not afraid to get out there and go do things and don't take risks that you can't afford to lose it all on. So know where the line is, know where your risk meter is, but it's unbelievable what you can go accomplish in this really put forth a little bit of effort and patience and think about things a little bit differently. Tyler, thank you so much for joining us here at Snackable Solutions. Diesel laptops, check it out. Have a great day.